Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurology. On behalf of myself and my colleague Stacey McAllister, thank you for joining us today for this Brainwaves Live event. Brainwaves is a monthly live virtual event featuring University of Pittsburgh and UPMC neurological experts who will present on a wide range of neurological conditions and disorders. Today, we're very excited to highlight Dr. David Lacomas and Dr. Chris Donnelly. I could go on and on about these two scientific giants in the field of ALS, but we only have an hour with you today. Just a little housekeeping before we begin. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. Our first presenter today is Dr. David Lacomas. Dr. Lacomas is the Chief of Neuromuscular Division at UPMC and Professor of Neurology and Pathology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He serves as the Director of Clinical Research for the Live Like Blue Center for ALS Research. Dr. Lacomas, as for that, thank you and please take it away. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. It's great to be with you all today and welcome to this webinar where we will be chronicling ALS research at the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. Uh, I'm the historian, so I'll tell you the background and then we'll bring you up to the present. And Dr. Donnelly will take over the scientific aspects uh, after I introduce this topic and talk about some of our clinical research. So I came to the university in 1993 and in that era, in the early 1990s, there was a clinical research program that was run by my predecessor, Michael Giuliani. And the early studies uh, that were done here were on uh, the growth factor drugs, BDNF, CNTF, IGF-1. And I was secondarily involved in these studies and that introduced me to the world of clinical research. And then when uh, Dr. Giuliani left around 2000, I took over the research program and we became part of the uh, NEALS group, which was which is the Northeast ALS uh, consortium, research consortium. It started in New England, but now it covers the entire United States and several other countries. So it's a very large research group. And with them, we were involved in trials of uh, ceftriaxone and Celebrex. Unfortunately, these compounds were were not effective, but uh, we were happy to offer our patients the opportunities to get involved in, in clinical drug trials. Um, I then joined Dr. Robert Bowser, who uh, in the Department of Neuropathology, along with our dean at that time, Dr. Levine, formed the Center for ALS Research at the University of Pittsburgh, and that was in 2006. And our goal at that time, partly as it is right now as well, is to uh, form uh, extensive collaborations within the university so that we could work together toward finding uh, uh, treatments, cure for ALS. And in those days, most of my collaborations with Dr. Bowser were with regard to biological markers of disease, trying to find something that we could use to diagnose ALS. Um, and that work led to uh, identification of the protein neurofilament, which is released from nerve cells when they are damaged as a potential marker for uh, ALS. And many other groups have gone on to study this compound in more detail. We were involved in multiple uh, multi-center collaborations to look at the utility of, of neurofilament as a biomarker and it's being increasingly used increasingly used in clinical trials as a marker of uh, of disease and potentially something that we could follow or at least use to predict uh, onset of ALS in some of the familial types of ALS. So I think at one point I counted that I had done 300 spinal taps uh, to help uh, understand more about neurofilament and I thank uh, our patients who uh, were involved in these studies. I remember one patient who actually had eight spinal taps over time so that we could look at the levels of neurofilament uh, uh, as the disease changed. We then started collaborations within the university with our colleagues at the Graduate School of Public Health, and we still work with them to this day. Uh, Angela Malik uh, is a graduate student who is our, one of our graduate students working with Dr. Talbot and our other collaborators here. We also worked with our uh, ALS colleague from Allegheny General, Dr. Rana. And in some of these studies, we even extended uh, across the state of Pennsylvania with colleagues in Philadelphia, Dr. Hyman Patterson, to look at um, environmental risk factors and, and occupational risk factors for, for ALS, finding some signal uh, of uh, toxins and agricultural chemicals, potentially heavy metals, that may be involved 
as well as hazardous air pollutants. And uh, larger studies are necessary to prove these associations, but uh, work is ongoing uh, to look at environmental issues with ALS now also in conjunction with genetic uh, features. We then developed a collaboration with the neuroimaging group uh, through Dr. Friedlander in neurosurgery. Uh, and this collaboration still exists. And we started looking at the uh, white matter tracks in the brain, which do deteriorate over time in ALS. And we did some preliminary studies. And with uh, Dr. Ye, we're hoping to do more extensive studies in the future. These studies can be very helpful in uh, assisting with diagnosis and perhaps help our understanding of how the disease changes over time and in some cases uh, identify other diagnoses that we weren't expecting. And it might prove, uh, it may prove useful for uh, clinical trials in the future that we might see changes earlier on imaging than we do clinically, so we might be able to determine the effectiveness of a drug sooner rather than later. We also collaborated with other uh, investigators in the genetics group uh, looking at life factors, uh, depression, caregiver stress. We were involved in more clinical drug trials. We were involved in early development of R plus Premapexol, later called Dexpremapexol, which looked like a very promising treatment, but eventually fizzled out by phase three. And more recently, we were involved in a multi-center uh, multi study of the drug mexilotine, which might calm some of the overactive uh, nerve cells in the brain uh, in ALS patients, but we really were unable to prove efficacy to date. Then a big change occurred in our center around 2012-2013 through the Herculean efforts of our former patient Neil Alexander and his wife Suzanne, shown here with their family. Uh, they developed the Live Like Lou Foundation and funded uh, in conjunction with the university our current Live Like Lou Center for ALS Research. Uh, before Dr. Donnelly came, uh, as part of, of this group, um, they provided funding to help us start an IPS-induced pluripotent stem cell program uh, with Dr. Friedlander and Dr. Carlisle. Dr. Donnelly is subsequently doing this, but uh, here's Neil undergoing a skin biopsy by me, and then we took the skin and uh, it was turned into motor neurons in the lab so that we could study the behavior of these motor neuron neurons and the pathology to help understand uh, disease mechanisms in patients with motor neuron disease. Then we were fortunate enough to recruit Dr. Donnelly to be the scientific director at the center after doing his seminal work at Johns Hopkins on one of the subtypes of ALS, which I'm sure he'll talk to you about shortly. Since he has come, we've continued our collaborations with the, uh, the, the stem cell work uh, on certain patients, especially patients with genetic disorders. The uh, collaborations with our friends at the School of Public Health has expanded and he's working with them closely on looking at genetic factors and environmental factors together. We have uh, several other uh, collaborations that are ongoing. One is with uh, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville uh, this is from the group that discovered, uh, uh, one of the discoverers of uh, the C9 ORF, most common cause of genetic ALS, but we are looking at other potential causes with them, and through that work, uh, a new gene, a new genetic cause of ALS was discovered, T, uh, TO, TO1, and one of our patients was found to have that uh, abnormal gene. We've also worked in a very large study called GTAC that looks at the genome, uh, genetic components in ALS. The data from that study are under review and hopefully uh, we'll learn more about the genetic causes from that. We also work with uh, Dr. Julia Koffler, who's in neuropathology. She runs our brain bank and studies ALS in brain and spinal cord uh, tissue. And we collaborate with other investigators who are interested in, in, in this uh, tissues for their work. We also continue to be involved in uh, clinical drug trials. We are starting actually tomorrow. We will be uh, screening our first patient for an oral Adaravone study. Adaravone is a drug that is currently approved for use in ALS in its intravenous form, but it's being studied in the oral form. This particular study uh, evaluates the difference between daily use of the oral drug 
versus using it for two weeks on and two weeks off, similar to the uh, way the IV form is used. And patients are eligible for this study if they've had ALS for less than two years, if they have progression of disease, can't be static, their function mostly independent, and their measured breathing function at 70% or greater, and no prior IV exposure to the drug. Those are the main criteria, but there are others. Uh, so some uh, patients may be interested in this study. We were also recently named as a Healy platform trial site uh, through Niels and Mass General and the Barrow Neurologic Institute. These platform trials, uh, this is a novel way of performing clinical drug trials where multiple drugs can be studied at once. Uh, currently, three drugs are being studied and there's only one uh, placebo group. So there's a three out of four chance a subject would get an active drug. And if one doesn't seem to be changing the course, uh, they can be switched over. Now, our, our, we have not started uh, our involvement yet, but we expect it to be uh, in place perhaps by September or so. And Dr. Alaha, my colleague, will be in charge of these trials. Uh, we recently got uh, an NIH grant with uh, uh, Dr. Weber, who was at Pitt and is now at CMU, but is still part-time at Pitt, as well as colleagues at Mount Sinai uh, to look at placement of electrodes over the brain to study brain waves that can be then used to run a computer, basically brain computer interface. But as opposed to the traditional way of doing uh, brain computer interface, usually you have to do uh, take out a, a little piece of skull or drill a hole and put the electrodes in through a surgical procedure. This uh, study will look at the electrodes implanted through the jugular vein through cannulation and up through the sinus over the top of the brain so that uh, a major surgical procedure is not necessary. Uh, we've also uh, put in our, our, we're on the list to be involved in the phase three study of the Amelix drug which was, uh, looks useful, at least in an earlier phase study, and that's a combination of sodium phenylbutyrate and a terucidal. I'm not sure if we will be in this study, but there's a fair chance we will be participating. In the meantime, we continue to follow patients in our multidisciplinary uh, MDA ALS center. And uh, you could see a picture of Dr. Allaham, my colleague who we recruited last year uh, to um, take over the management of the, uh, the clinic, the multi-center clinic, and to uh, increase our number of patients. We will continue to make uh, clinical drug trials available to even more patients with his help. And you could see there the extent of the team that uh, we have in place to see our patients in a longitudinal fashion. And that ends my portion of this presentation. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Donnelly. Thank you, Dr. Lacomas. Uh, very informative presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Donnelly uh, is next up, and uh, we're honored to have you with us, Dr. Donnelly. Uh, Dr. Donnelly is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurobiology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and the scientific director of the Live Like Blue Center for ALS Research at the University of Pittsburgh Brain Institute. Uh, Dr. Donnelly, thank you so much again for being here with us today, and um, please take it away. All right, uh, you guys can see everything okay? Looks okay. great. Yep. All right, thank you. So thanks everyone for being here today, and thanks Dr. Lacomas um, for a uh, nice introduction to everything. I'll just first thank everyone for coming. I guess it's the first Lou Gehrig's day, um, so sort of a timely event that we're having here. Um, and I do kind of adding to what David said about Neil Alexander, I think, um, although I'd never, I was unfortunate to have never met Neil, um, I arrived uh, and, and took up a position here shortly after he passed away of ALS. He's got a really wonderful photo series kind of progressing his experience with the disease. And so I always start uh, every talk with this uh, photo series because I think it really puts uh, into pictures what uh, individuals with this disease have to go through and why it's so important for us to really understand the biology of what's going on so that we can find therapeutic interventions for it. Um, the just to give you a quick overview of what our center is, and I'll talk a little bit about the science that we're doing, but I want to kind of give everyone an overview of some of the efforts that we've been uh, taking on here at Pitt uh, for the past five years or so. And I think this is probably one of the first of many 
seminar series that we'll have online in the future, um, maybe have more with more specific topics. But to give everyone an overview, the goal of our group uh, here at PID is to really understand what's going on in ALS and to try to figure out ways that we can intervene. Um, and the way that we do that, or the way that we're proposing to do that, and have been doing that for the past couple of years, is through some physical laboratories that are dedicated really to ALS research and related disorders like FTD. Um, my lab is one of those, a, a PI who was formerly a postdoc in the ALS center here. Uh, Amanda Glexner is now kind of starting her own independent work. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, with We also try to fund in clinical trials with any monies that come through uh, through our center. Some goes to clinical trial work uh, with Dr. Lacomas. We've also put in a significant amount of effort and amount of funding to try to build up some of the resources here at Pitt to really match those, if not exceed those in many cases of some of these other universities worldwide that have been um, uh, studying ALS. Uh, and this particularly has to do with things like our biorepositories that David and uh, Dr. Julia Koffler, who are instrumental in, um, in uh, uh, establishing, and I'm just going to change this to a laser pointer, there we go, uh, an IPSC core that I'll mention in a moment. Uh, we've put a significant amount of money into purchasing lab equipment and microscopes available to anyone interested in uh, using them for doing re research that could help ALS um, research, and then funding a number of different um, fellowships, and we're hoping to start funding seed grants. So the fellowships, we have at least two that we're starting, one in the name of Neil Alexander, who we met, and one in the name of Barbara McCormick, a, a really beloved member of our community here in Pittsburgh, who passed away, um, not at ALS, but uh, was a, a supporter of our work and just a, a dear friend. Um, and obviously, Mr. Neil Alexander, who, who was instrumental in setting up and pushing ALS research here at Pitt and getting the university to really put a lot of um, effort into it. Uh, we're also hoping to start some seed grants to really push some high risk, high reward projects because you need some early data in order to get high funding, uh, funding from the uh, National Institutes of Health and other government um, organizations. And we've begun some seminar series, uh, both uh, virtually in the days of COVID. We were starting them in person prior to that happening. And we've got some community outreach efforts that I'll talk about. And then if you just look at the makeup, I would say that the two directors are myself and Dr. Lacomas, and we have a number of primary members in different who focus on different areas of biology, clinical, or basic research. We also have uh, a number of affiliated members like Evelyn Talbot, who is an epidemiologist looking at environmental factors that are uh, potentially involved in ALS and some really interesting findings. And then some newer people who are just venturing into the field of ALS, bringing their expertise from systems neuroscience and MRI of human brains and, and bringing that into, uh, into the ALS space. Uh, and, and we're hoping to help provide them sort of the information and the ability to kind of do that uh, work because it's always challenging to move to a new field. So we want to make it as easy as possible. Some of the um, successes that we've had so far, I think they're, they're pretty pretty big considering we started off as a smaller group and a lot of this has to do with the really phenomenal um, just team of people and collaborative nature of Pitt and of working with the clinicians and the basic science has had this great relationship here. Uh, we have funding from a number of, fun of government agencies, federal funding sources, which are really the most prominent uh, funding that we have, but require the most data to get. And then we have um, a number of uh, grants that we've received in the past or currently have from private organizations around the country or internationally. Uh, we've started a number of seminar series. We've had some in person. We've had uh, funded um, sphere events here where we brought researchers in from around the country or around the world at Pitt to have a two or three day uh, meeting on ALS. Uh, and just sort of an open forum. We've since moved that virtually in our days of, of COVID. Um, and then we put a significant amount of money again into a bio repository that I'll talk about in a moment, uh, some common resources, the clinical trials, and some interesting things that we've got going on here are, um, we have a, uh, uh, a community outreach program that we began with the Beating the Odds Foundation. Um, and what this is, is essentially uh, we've developed a high school course on ALS and dementia that's currently in two high schools. In, uh, it's actually in Eastern PA in Great Valley and Coatesville High School. 
Um, and so this has been going on, I think, three years now. So these students learn about ALS and related diseases, and we try to get them interested in different ways that they can be involved um, either through medical or research or even other things like advocacy and government work to help kind of make an impact um, and try to help these diseases that are, that are really uh, just horrible. Um, and lastly, we've got some patents and a spin-off company that have come from work that started here at Pitt. Um, and, and, and I think that's just really important because we do eventually want to find a drug and that's one way that we can do that. So uh, the one thing I want to talk about in, uh, today is uh, a new initiative that we have set up where we've generated a deuce pluripotent, pluripotent stem cell core. And so these are really exciting. Uh, it's an exciting tool. They're fairly new in science. Uh, prior to the development of this technology, uh, there was no way that we could look at a living human neuron because you can't take out neurons from a person. Um, so this uh, originated from the ability to essentially what, what we understand from what we understand about development and neurodevelopment and what we can do and what we do regularly and routinely with Dr. Lucomis and Dr. Koffler is we take skin or blood cells from individuals and we reprogram into what we call these iPSCs or these induced pluripotent stem cells. And the way that we do that is we trick the cells into thinking that they're in early development by expressing factors that um, these cells would be exposed to or expressing in early development. And then when we have these early iPSC cells, we can generate a number of different cellular cell types. Um, obviously, the one that we're very interested in are neuronal cells, but certainly you can do things like muscle cells, skeletal muscle, cardiac tissue, things like that. Um, we're focused, obviously, on motor neurons and cortical neurons of the brain of humans, uh, but we're not limited to those, and that's what's really exciting. The nice thing about this is that they're highly reversible. Once we have them, they take quite a bit of work to make. Once we have them, we have them forever. Um, so we have neurons that people have donated to us 10 or 15 years ago that we still work with on a daily basis. And so they live on in our research, um, uh, you, know, in, 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 uh, you know, forever essentially until we decide we will no longer use them. But the nice thing is it's, again, the first time that we can actually study human neurons and the really beautiful part about this is that it retains a person's genetic profile. So this allows for individualized personal medicine and things like that for us to look into as we move forward. The cells that we get start off as things like fibroblasts, which are here. So these are skin cells that we collected from a, per a patient um, here at UPMC, and we grow them after we collect the cells. And uh, when we then reprogram them and differentiate them, these are stained to look very pretty but we differentiate them and this is what we end up getting. So you go from this cell to this cell. And these are functional motor neurons that we can now use to study what is going wrong in patients with ALS or not, or healthy individuals. Um, the person run, we, we recently put a significant amount of resources into starting a core here as one of the first and first cores to do this, or the only that I know of. Um, it's being run by Amanda Glexner, who is a former postdoc in the center and now running her own group. Um, and the idea is that she is basically supporting, in addition to our own research, anyone at Pitt who is interested in studying ALS, she will help them get these cells ready to go and work with them so that they can use that um, data and start studying ALS from patients, patient cells. Um, it's a really powerful tool because it's a very expensive thing to set up, but because we have the infrastructure to do it already, we can now support other people who want to get into the field with a limited investment on their end, but actually help them get grants and help them kind of make new discoveries in our field. It's always good to bring new people into the field um, rather than keeping people out. Um, so I, I will tell you a little bit about some research going on in my lab, which I think is really exciting. And um, uh, I won't take too much time, but I just wanted to highlight that, uh, you know, if you're here, you probably have an understanding of what ALS is. But again, the, the disease itself, there's a number of characteristics. Um, the average age of onset is about 55, but it doesn't have to be. There are younger forms of disease often associated with genetic mutations. Um, there's various uh, progressions that can occur depending on the individual, and there's different subtypes, be it sporadic or familial. There's some environmental factors, such as if you're in the US military, you have an increased prevalence of this, and the DOD recognizes that, and we have funding from the DOD to study it. Um, and there's also some link to soccer uh, as well as TBI, uh, although that, that's not yet understood. We, don't, we still don't know it as well as football, but we still don't know exactly what the, what the link is, um, why, that, why they're linked. 
And there's also a link to some dementia, specifically frontal temporal degenerative dementia. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because we think that if we can understand what's going on in ALS and target ALS and correct some of the features of ALS or slow the disease, we think it'll be applicable to a wide variety of other diseases like frontal temporal degeneration or frontal temporal dementia. So the ALS itself, genetically, about 85 to 90 percent of it, you know, we have no uh, patients have no known genetic cause or family history. And that 10 percent that do uh, have been used uh, historically to study what genes are playing a role in this disease. And there are a lot of genes that can cause ALS. Um, it, as of 2015, there are somewhere between 30 to 40 uh, mutations that can be causative for ALS. Again, they're very rare. It's only a small percentage of patients. But what is important to think about is if we look at the first gene discovered, you can have one of 150 mutations that can that can cause it. So you only really need one of these 150 mutations in that single gene to uh, to, to develop ALS, which makes it kind of frustrating from a genetic standpoint to study. And this is one of the reasons where historically we've studied ALS from a genetic perspective because we knew that was the common factor in some patients and we could study what is going on with that mutation and why is it causing ALS. Having these iPSCs, now we can study it in patients who have no genetic cause and have the sporadic or no known genetic cause and have it from the sporadic population. But there are some other overlaps between patients other than the genetics. Um, uh, I, I did mention uh, uh, the connection between FTD and one of the things to point out is that some ALS mutations like the mutation in the c 9 Earth gene that, that David had mentioned is not only causative for ALS, it was actually causative for FTD as well. And there are some ALS mutations that only cause ALS and there are some FTD mutations that only cause FTD and there are some that can cause one or the other and we don't really know why yet that happens. Um, but uh, one thing that is kind of interesting uh, and, and another area that we can study some commonalities in disease across all ALS patients or the majority of them is that regardless of that gen the genetic, you know, 85% being sporadic and 10%, 10 to 15% having a genetic cause, uh, nearly all ALS patients have, 97% have the same pathology. This is TBP43 protein. Um, and that means that when you look in individuals who have ALS, in some of the cells that are affected, they'll show this abnormal uh, feature. And I'll show you what that looks like. You also see this in some FTD patients. Um, and this is what it does look like. It looks like that should normally look like this. This is a nuclei of a cell. What you'll see is that it's kind of clumped and it's, it's not where the nucleus is. Um, oh, sorry, this made a mistake here. But the point being, uh, what ends up happening is this nuclear protein gets misnuclear, mislocalized to the cytoplasm. And we see this not only in ALS, but we see it in about 60 to 80% of Alzheimer's disease, about 80% of CTE, and then again in FTD as well. Um, so this pathology is called TDP pathology, something that my lab is highly interested in. And we know that if you have this pathology or if, if you try to induce this pathology in cells, it's toxic. It can cause neurodegeneration. And the pathology itself is that the protein should be in the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is, but it gets stuck on the outside in ALS. And we don't know why. We have some theories. And it aggregates and forms these clumps. Um, and that leads to neurodegeneration. So one, step, so one of the problems we have historically with this disease, and I will finish in a moment here, but one of the problems we've historically had with studying this pathology in ALS is that it's really difficult to model. How do you put this into a cell? How do you study it in a cell if you know, this is something that happens in the disease that doesn't happen normally in cells? Um, and so we developed a system to do that, um, and it relies on light. It's kind of interesting. I'll show you a quick video, um, and this is published uh, in 2019. Uh, and what we did was we took something from a plant that in response to blue light in the plant, it comes together in the plant. Because again, this pathology is, is a clumping event essentially that we observe of this protein. And so we, we said, we know that this in this plant protein, it's reversible. It happens in response to light. The plant uses it to grow in the direction of sunlight. But we took a fragment of that protein, we put it onto our protein that uh, at TDP43 that clumps in the disease, and we tried to recreate the pathology in cells, in human neurons, like those iPSCs that I showed you. And so I'm going to show you a video here, uh, the protein that we, the, the TDP protein, we put Opto in front of it, which basically just indicates it's a light responsive protein. And so this is a neuron, a human neuron. Um, this is TDP43 in white, 
uh, in this gray white color and then the neuron here is in purple. And what we did was took images of it on one of our microscopes, in this case without light, every half hour for um, the time's going to be up here. I think it's for 50 hours or a couple of days. And what you observe is that in a normal cell without light, that TDP protein is mostly nuclear. It's a kind of condensed signal. It looks normal. And the cell in current turn is pretty happy. It's going about its business up to the 60 hours that we imaged it. Now, if we take this light response of TDP, we expose it to light now during this imaging press session, um, what we'll start to see is that those cells, they start to, that protein starts to clump and eventually the neuron dies. And hopefully you guys can see that. And so what's exciting about this is now we had a way to model a feature of the disease that was common to nearly all patients who had ALS. And what we found and what we've published with this is that TDP itself, when it's normally in the nucleus, it's interacting with these substrates called RNAs, which is a, a new, a, uh, something in the nucleus that uh, comes from DNA. But in the disease, it's not. And in the disease, it's forming these clumps because it's not interacting with these little squiggy lily lines, which are RNAs. And so RNA interaction prevents this clumping from happening. And, and again, we published this, but it was very exciting because then we were able to start playing around and say, well, could we design fake RNAs, these designer RNAs, to treat cells using this model that we developed and try to reverse or prevent these inclusions as clumping from occurring and protect the neuron from dying. And it turns out it does work on some level. It's still very early, but what's exciting is that we developed these RNAs, they're called oligos, these designer RNAs are called oligonucleotides. And if we treat cells with it, what ends up happening is that we can create these clumps in that light inducible system. We can treat the cells, the neurons, the human neurons with these oligonucleotides that bind to this protein, this TDP that's not interacting with what it should interact. And then what ends up happening is that it seems to protect the cell from those clumps or even reverse the clumps. And so this is really exciting for us because we think this, whether or not this is the cause of ALS, it's certainly something that we think is, and we see is happening in the disease. And so maybe it's a potential therapeutic. We don't know, it's still early and we're still exploring it, but we know that oligonucleotides are used in other diseases for other purposes. And so we thought, well, this could potentially be something to explore. And so it's a, an ongoing area of research in my lab among some other genetic studies that we'll maybe go into in the future. And so with that, I'll just stop and just highlight some of the great work uh, from the group, Amanda Glaxon being the, the one person who's now in her own group. We have a number of collaborators and a number of funding sources. Um, and that's uh, where I'll end today, but I think we'll probably have some future calls. We can go into more detail about different projects, but I hope you know, the exciting work that's been going on at Pitt, not just in our group, but in all the group and the collaborative nature between the clinicians and scientists, epidemiologists, um, and so on, uh, you know, excites you as well. I, I'm, we're, we're really enthusiastic that uh, we have something special going on here and, um, you know, hope to keep informing you of some new and exciting discoveries along the way. So with that, I will stop. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Donnelly. What an incredible presentation. Uh, we're so fortunate to have both you and Dr. Lacomas with us at the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. We're now going to begin the Q&A portion of our presentation. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can in our allotted time. And since Dr. Donnelly's up here with us, we'll start off with him first. Uh, first question, Dr. Donnelly, in your opinion, what will it take for a cure or something close to a cure to be discovered? Yeah, that's a great question. Start so, off light, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, give me the easy one. Uh, so, you know, I'm not a clinician, so I don't want to state something. But I do think that one thing uh, I've learned kind of looking at successful fields uh, like cancer has been very successful at developing treatments for cancer. Um, there's no question there. And I think one of the things is that we haven't developed a cure for cancer, have we? For the most part, right? I mean, you know, I'm sure someone could argue that. But we've developed treatments. And I think the way we have to look at ALS and these neurodegenerative diseases as a whole is that one, we, we don't really have any good treatments yet. I mean, we're starting to develop for the first time treatments for things like SMA, uh, these genetic disorders that we're able to slow or halt. We haven't cured them, but we're getting really close to, to giving people who normally wouldn't have a few years, giving them years and years and years of life expectancy. I think for ALS, we have to think about it the same way. Can we make ALS a chronic disease? Can we, we might not yet know the cause and we still, there's probably a lot of causes, 
There's probably a lot of factors that contribute to it. But can we make it chronic? And I think there's some exciting stuff going on in the genetic forms of ALS, where they're developing gene therapies to target some of the genetic forms that spike on some of these mutant proteins. Um, but for most patients who have the sporadic form of the disease, I think we need to look at treatments and think about treatments as a way to make it a chronic disease or slow the disease and give people functionality. Um, so, you know, I'm, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to give false hope, but I'm very hopeful seeing some of the things going on uh, with things like uh, instant oligonucleotides and some of the th things like the platform trial that David had mentioned, you know, just relooking at maybe there's subsets of patients who are responsive to certain drugs and subsets who aren't, but we've missed them in the way clinical trials were done before. And that's why it's so important to just reevaluate all that. And then maybe David can jump in there and say something about it. Yeah, I mean, what, what I would say to sort of just kind of go along with what you're saying, Chris, is that um, identification of disease pathways seems to be the key. So uh, in the genetic forms, um, at least we know there's a mutation, so there might be a way to fix the disease pathway kind of upstream, if you will, from where the damage is really occurring because of the mutation. Uh, I think in the sporadic forms, uh, if we could identify the final common mechanism of cell death, which you know you, know, you may be onto something with the, the aggregation, disaggregation of TDP, and work on that, then I think we have a treatment. I don't know if we have a cure, but if we could if we can identify the final common pathway that they all of these patients have, because it's not really one one disease, but uh, if we could define that element and then treat that, we could we could certainly have a successful treatment. And then we have to work backwards, finding the different pathways because they're probably common pathways to groups of patients, whether it's mitochondrial damage or something else, and then work on that as well. And then we're talking about drug combinations like uh, we use in cancer. I mean, that that's the way I see it. And I think the, I, the IPS cells, you know, that IPSC, that's really our best hope, I think, in, in working on, especially the non-genetic forms. Thank you both. Uh, Dr. Lacomas, since you're up on the screen here, a uh, question for you. Uh, when should someone consider genetic testing for ALS? Well, I, I, you know, this is complicated, um, but we are offering screening for the most common mutation, the C9-ORF72 mutation in all patients, at least on a research basis right now, because we know that about approximately 10% of patients without a family history um, may have that mutation, which means it's the gene is in the family and it, it's probably the cause of their ALS and other family members may be at risk. So since research is ongoing in treating that subtype, I think it's useful to know if patients have that particular type of ALS, even if they don't have a family history. Um, otherwise, we don't really recommend genetic testing in the absence of a family history. If there is a positive family history, then I think genetic testing is indicated. Uh, but one has to really be careful about considering genetic testing because it really opens up, you know, a can of worms, if you will. If you find an unexpected gene in the family, there's a lot of anxiety. So uh, careful consideration has to be made, discussion with the physician. Sometimes we'll send patients to genetic counselors to really think about uh, that issue. It's a big, it's a big issue right now. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lucomas. Uh, another question for you here. How can patients and families make sure they are consuming scientifically based information about ALS and not listening to quote unquote gimmicks? Yeah, I think, you know, if you stick to the, the websites from the societies that really deal more with ALS, the ALS Association, the MDA, ALS uh, organization, um, we have a website at Pitt, you know, sticking to sort of the mainstream uh, organizations. There's also a very interesting group called ALS Untangled, uh, run by Dr. Bedlack, and uh, he's affiliated with the Niels group that I mentioned, and they look at a lot of different therapies that patients are interested in, and they will outline whether they think this is scientifically reasonable, what the risks are, if there's any known data. So I'll often refer patients to ALS Untangled if they ask me about, you know, vitamin cocktail or some other regimen, because, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of things out there that patients should really stay away from. 
Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Lucomas. Great information. Uh, next question here for Dr. Donnelly. Um, how would you like to see your research and lab grow in the next five years? Oh, wow. Well, that's a great question. I think, you know, if you look historically at a lot of ALS research, um, it was a highly unfunded disease to study for years. Um, it's getting better. There's a lot more awareness. Um, but as a result of that, you know, there were people who studied it from the beginning. And so I do think that there are a good amount of sort of silos um, where you have one university and there's like one group and that's that. I think what, what would be really uh, great, and I think we have a really nice start to this here, is to develop um, not just sort of my lab, but like a collaborative center where, as we have been doing, but where there are more common resources like closer together. So, I mean, one of the issues has always been, is always, you know, where people are located and, and facilities and equipment and things like that. And I think sort of having those things sort of common spaces, common areas, and having maybe multiple investigators within a closer proximity would be great. So I, you know, I do expect us to grow, but I think more of it along the line that I'd rather just ALS research at Pitt continue to grow as it has been. And one way that we can do that is by promoting people. It's really hard to get into this field. <laughs> it's really hard to get into a new field in general. Um, and so if we can help people and kind of lower the threshold or the barriers to entry and promote people who maybe study basic science, who study systems neuroscience, and we've been doing some of this, but help them get in, maybe funding someone in their lab to do work, have kind of meetings, you know, locally more often and more regularly. I think that would be the smartest, most efficient way to go because it's always good to have new, uh, new perspectives in the field. Um, you know, people coming from an outside in the field, if you've been in it, you, know, you're, you, you kind of have a perspective and coming from an outside field, you may, be, may bring something completely new to it. So I think rather than saying my lab grow, I think we just want to continue bringing in people, making it a comfortable environment for people who are not currently doing ALS research, but have an inkling to do so to come in to, to get here. That's what we're trying to do now. Very good, thank you. I think it's a nice segue into this question that uh, that they uh, uh, an attendee asked for both of you. How did you end up with the career you have? Did you always know you wanted to be in this type of research? Do Dr. Want... Donnelly, go ahead. Uh, I, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I didn't. I, I um, when I was like 15, 16 years old, I read Tuesdays with Maury in high school. I had to for a class, and that's what first got me interested in ALS. And then uh, when I decided to do uh, my PhD, I, I focused on um, nerve regeneration. And then I finally had the opportunity to get involved in ALS um, after that. And that's when I uh, went to Johns Hopkins and, and focused on ALS. So I, I can thank a, a teacher that 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 uh, told us to read Tuesdays with Maury in high school. That's how I got interested in it, for sure. That's a great story. Uh, Dr. Lacoma, same question for you. How did you end up in in uh, career your career doing what you do? Well, I, I guess I got to a certain point in my career. Um, I'm, I'm focused on neuromuscular diseases, especially my senior gravis muscle disease (ALS). And basically, I looked at looked around and and thought, where is the greatest need? Uh, where should I focus my research efforts for the for the next? 20 years or whatever, and obvi the, the obvious answer was ALS. Um, you know, it's 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 really a difficult disease for, you know, obviously it's a horrible disease for patients, difficult for families, it's difficult for us as clinicians as well, and 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 our staff. But our best hope is really what we could do on the research front. So um, that that was my reason for going into ALS research, and I you know I'd also like to. To make a comment for for any patients out there with ALS that we are all in this together and um, when I first started doing this 20 years ago patients were much more willing to participate in all all types of clinical research I told you about a patient that had eight eight spinal taps for a research program I you know I would send out letters you know do you want to participate in this research and I would get at least five back every time and over the last five years or so, that has changed a lot. Um, uh, patients have been interested in hearing about stem cells 
and medical marijuana and and not really as much in clinical research. People who are tuned in today probably are, but there are only 20,000 or so patients in the U.S. with ALS, and we really need people to participate in all these studies, whether it's just a questionnaire about risk factors or giving a blood sample. Um, but we're, we're all in this together, and we really need to continue to work toward that same common goal that we have. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Lacomas, a uh, question for you. What makes ALS care different at UPMC than other institutions? Well, I'm not I'm not sure that it's unique. Um, I think that um, I think that there are certain centers that offer very high quality multidisciplinary care, and we're we're one of those centers. Um, and you know, it's the multidisciplinary care is basically where you have all of these services performed in a single setting, where you see two or three different neurologists who are specialized in ALS, nurse practitioner, uh, access to clinical trials. Uh, checking breathing, physical therapy, occupational therapy. We have people specialized in speech and swallowing, which is a little different than most places. Usually one person does both. And so, so we're, we have two different people there uh, and social services. So, um, and I, you know, I think that that's really the benefit of coming to our clinic. Very good, thank you, Dr. Comas. Uh, next question for uh, Dr. Donnelly. Um, I'm a supporter of research at the University of Pittsburgh. How would a gift to your lab uh, help advance your research? So I think there's two different uh, kinds of things. So, you know, any gifts, I, I would say that in general, uh, gifts are incredibly helpful for us because, you know, the, the bread and butter of how we run, people don't, I guess people aren't super familiar with how labs are run, but essentially we run a lab like we would run a business. We have budgets, we have employees, we we handle it that way. And and our our funding is based off of uh, federal funding for the most part. We you know we have these nonprofits who are graciously give us money when you know we apply for grants. Um, and, and for the federal funding we apply for grants. The problem is, is that you know with taxpayer dollars, uh, rightly so you need a lot of data you need a lot of work going into it in order to get the funding. The funding is more, it's more stable, you get it longer. The problem is that you need a lot of work to get it. And, and the, the success rate is maybe about 10%. So it can be very frustrating, uh, a lot of failures in between. Uh, it's getting better, um, but that being said, the gifts to our lab or to the center are so helpful because they allow us to do things like if a piece of equipment breaks down, you know, it, the federal funding doesn't really pay for that. That's stuff that we have to figure out how to get money for other ways. We may have to apply for a grant for that separately. It takes a long time. Equipment for things like if uh, we want to do a seed grant, a high risk, high reward project, you know, someone says, I have this idea. I think it could be really cool. It could be really big. I want to try it in ALS. If you have no data to support that, you're not going to get federal funding for that. Um, we would use private funding for those things. And, and, and some of the work that I showed you, in fact, uh, today, was supported by private funding and it was high, high risk, high reward, but you can clearly see there's potential therapeutic potential there as we continue that research. So now we have federal funding for it, but we didn't necessarily in the beginning. So I think it's just, it allows us to speed the, the pace of research. It allows us to put the funding towards things that uh, we wouldn't be able to put towards normally, uh, things like equipment repairs, uh, fellowships and, and and if we if we do it from a center perspective, uh, it allows us to promote people who are not in ALS research and give them some support to get involved in ALS research or ALS research so that they can they can apply for federal funding in ALS research. Excellent. Long answer. Sorry. <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> uh, I think we have room for for one more question. It's uh, directed to Dr. Donnelly here. Uh, what made you excited to come to the University of Pittsburgh, and what do you enjoy most about your work? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I think I probably have one of the most uh, rewarding jobs you could possibly imagine. Um, I, uh, I Pittsburgh. The reason I came to Pittsburgh, and you know, when I was deciding on where to go, um, a lot of it had to do with my interactions with um, uh, David. The clinicians such as Julia Koffler, uh, the department itself, the support from the university. Um, this was probably the most supportive place 
basically said they want you to succeed. It was, you know, this is a tier one research university and um, it's a competitive research university, but it is incredibly coll uh, collegial and collaborative within Pitt. You can't say that about every place. So when I came here, it was very quickly that you realized that there was not a barrier, institutional barriers. There are no barriers between David and I. That's not always the case between clinicians and scientists at places. Sometimes the clinicians, the one doing the basic research. So um, I just think the environment is just so friendly and it supports collaboration. And frankly, my my personal belief, and I think if you look at successes in ALS and other fields, is that collaboration is how you get bringing experts together is how you get uh, treatments and how you get or how you move the field forward in, in ALS or any, frankly. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my 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 pitch for for pitch for sure. So David's short answer is David. <laughs> Dr. Lacomas, I'm sure you'll take that as well, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't know, but I'll take it. <laughs> well, I just there was just one last comment and, and I guess a question that I can help answer that uh, she said, thank you both. Uh, this event was very informative. Uh, we have future events and um, yes, that's our plan. Our plan is to have uh, future events and um, keep this up as a series. So. Uh, just want to thank all of our attendees. Thank you, Dr. Lacomas. Thank you, uh, Dr. Donnelly. And um, if you have any questions after the event is over, please email me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. Um, thank you again to everybody and uh, be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you all.